Good. So um, I, I have had um, a lot of experience with HL7. But whenever I talk about HL7, I feel like the, the little boy who has to say that the emperor doesn't have any clothes. Um, I really don't understand HL7, but I have written a lot about HL7. And um, I think I'm probably by far the leader when it comes to critical secondary literature on HL7. Uh, the only blog I have is, is called HL7 Watch. Uh, if you want to read a very funny entry, you should read the entry on the weight of the baby. It's about how you deal with weight measurements in HL7. And it's really very funny. I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of HL7 because I want to teach you a life lesson, which is be very careful to choose the right parents. <laughs> now, fire may or may not have chosen the right parent, uh, but I think that there is an issue here. So this is just a random selection from an HL7 implementation guide, a more modern one. I should explain, HL7 has proceeded through various versions. Version 2 is still the version that is the most used. Version 3 is the cause of all FIRE's problems, or anyway, is, is the cause of many of FIRE's problems. Uh, version 3 is based on something called the RIM, the Reference Information Model. And um, we will see some problems with the RIM in a minute, but these are some examples of what happens when you try and work using the RIM. So this is a, a guide for coding allergy information. Um, so the allergy information has to contain exactly one allergy problem act. So we are, we are now on one sample page. We now must go to another sample page where the rules for coding a problem act are described. You have to have all of these things in a problem act. You have to have a mood code, an effective time, an active suspended code, an entry relationship, and so on. You have to have exactly one allergy alert observation. So you go to the page describing the rules for allergy alert observation, and you see this kind of um, long list which tell you that you need an, a problem status and a reaction observation. So you prob go to problem status and you see another long page of rules. And um, you go to reaction observation and you see another long page of rules and, and then you look, well, a reaction observation has to have exactly one procedure activity procedure. Now, I'm assuming that eventually, if we drill down even further, we will need a procedure, activity, procedure, activity, procedure. <laughs> now, there are all kinds of things wrong with this. And I try, in my way, to document them on the uh, HL7 watch. Uh, I, I stopped. Uh, so the, the, I, I was really hopeful that fire would be a good thing. And I stopped the blog on February the 12th, 2014. That was my last post, I thought. Now, why does HL7 bring about this kind of, um, for me anyway, problematic seeming um, set of rules? Uh, the first reason, and I followed this very carefully, is that HL7 version 3 has a lot of well-meaning people who really want to improve the standard. And so where you have a, a bad definition, uh, for instance, a living subject is defined as an organism which is alive or dead. That, that, it's still there. People thought that was not quite good enough, so it's been changed. Um, now it says a living subject is something which is essentially living uh, but may be dead, something like that. <laughs> um, the problem is that when they create better versions of definitions, they don't delete the old ones. And sometimes the new ones are logically quite different from the old ones, but they're just compiled together. In it, and they survive in different places, sometimes com compiled visibly together, sometimes just in different places together. And so you get forking and you get failure. The second reason 
Or I think seem to have missed out the second reason. The second reason is that the rim is just bad. It, it's, it's a bad basis for doing any kind of intelligent work. Um, it, it, was, it was well intentioned. They thought, well, let's constrain everybody to code in exactly the same way so that we will have interoperability. This is the goal, that it's, a, it's a good goal. But they constrained everybody in a nonsensical way. You're only allowed to have three kinds of entities acts, roles, and entities. That, delete that. You're only allowed to have three kinds of things or acts, roles, entities. Roles are patient role, doctor role. They're, they're fairly easily understandable. Entities. Well, we have a definition. The entity class is defined as classifies the entity class and all of its subclasses. That is what we call circularity. Uh, it's, uh, the rest doesn't help you. The rest is just chatter. And then we have some examples of what an entity is. And if you can work out what those things have in common, which they, makes them entities, then um, you're a better man than I. Now, but, so, entity corresponds to the entity class. The problem is, we have acts, which presumably are acts, for instance, moving your arms in anger, roles and entities. Now, what are diseases? They're not act. What, what's an accidental poisoning? It's not an act, but it's not a role and it's not an entity. So what is, what is a disease? The answer is, a disease is an observation of a disease. That's an act. The, the, that is the basic flaw running through the entirety of the rim, and it makes it very difficult to code sensibly using anything which is based on the rim. Now, the fourth reason, I, I, I've lost reason number two, I'm sorry. The fourth reason is that it's all done by voting. That's one of the reasons why these odd phenomena with compiled definitions arise. People vote, and they, people don't like to vote against a definition which someone else created, and so it, they keep it somewhere. Now, if you're doing mathematics, you can't decide what to do next with a proof of a theorem by voting. It doesn't make sense. And this is hard work. It's like mathematics. And if it's based on voting, you will end up with nonsense. All right. So, and I predict no one will ever be able to use computers to check the correctness of HL7 version 3 coding. It's, n it's an art. It's a black art. Um, all right. Now, Graham Greve is the reason why I stopped posting to HL7 Watch. I like Graham. He's an a intelligent person. He's well-meaning. He assured me that, eight, that fire was going to be a new departure, that it would not make the mistakes of the rim. And so I said, I'll, I, I said to myself, I'll give fire a chance. And I, I agree with David in very many of the positive features of FHIR. So I, too, want to standardize the standards. I want to do all the things that David is trying to do with the Yosemite project. And FHIR, it, it seemed at the beginning, anyway, a good starting point. It was going to be simpler than the HL7 version 3. It was going to use the modern kinds of technology rather than the walkie-talkie model, which is what HL7 is based on, and so on. So I started to look at fire, and I gave it some time. It's still a draft. It's still, as, as it's explained here, a work in progress, and it may change rapidly. That is, may be a good thing, but it may also be a bad thing. So the HL7 version 3 was initiated 19 years ago. It still doesn't work. And it still has true believers who have powerful positions. One of them may even be in this room. Um, so if this changes rapidly, it may just change rapidly to create more and more problems. But it may get better. Now, I, I think I've found some obvious mistakes here. But the first mistake is the very first line in the fire turtle package. So I took the fire turtle package 
uh, yesterday, actually, I checked. The first line, it's not in larger font, but it says fire definitions. That's what it's called. So we're given a long, long list of fire definitions in turtle format. So with HL7, they don't always claim to be giving definitions. They, they told them comments or descriptions. That's fine. But if you claim to be giving definitions, you should give definitions. And w there was one line when, when David, by accident, looked at a piece of fire, and he said, terrible definition. Now, all of this is terrible. All, every single item in here is not a definition. They don't know what a definition is. Now, let, it may change rapidly. I, I propose that they delete definition and write some softer word, chatter, or bits and pieces of text associated with this word. <laughs> All right, so age. I chose age as a random example. This is the definition. Well, I don't know where the definition of age is. Yes? So that, I think that file, the definition, yeah. um, you've downloaded that from the GitHub, from the file. Oh, I don't, don't know anymore. Site, Did you? From the HL7 site, okay. yes. Yeah, so that is, that is trailing way behind. OK, but still, this is yeah. sort of fun. Okay. And, then you, and, then, and then you will have the problem if the, if the stuff that's not trailing is like this. So um, and there's no cheating here. We're going to check. All right, so age. It's something like a duration length of time with a unified coding units of measure code. Something like that. That's not a definition of age. There are billions of strings which refer to a length of time with a UCOM code, which are not ages. The number of times I move my leg here is a number. Well, it's not quite a UCOM code. So the length of my foot, that's not a time. So the length of my moving my arm, that's seven seconds. I use the UCOM code. That's not an age of anything. So this is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. But for a definition, you need both. All right, so in the, the BFO book, which you'll find described in your uh, program, chapter four contains a, a set of best practices, practices for writing definitions. They're very easy. They make your ontology better, and they make your definitions better if you follow these simple best practices. Yep? One more comment about, if, can you back up? Yeah. Like, just so you understand where this is coming from. So this, uh, this is RDF here. This is actually physically automatically from the fire specification. Okay. So this is not anything that was custom written in RDF. So there's this whole mechanism that is being done that will auto-generate the RDF version, the RDF ontology, from the fire specification. So we are working very hard, very often, to create necessary and sufficient conditions. Yes. We don't always succeed. Right. Snow, SnowMed doesn't even try. No. Here, they don't even know. But the, uh, the, what, whichever non-human being wrote these definitions didn't know what a definition was. Tell them that they're, they're specified. I mean, there's good evidence that their definitions They're not definitions, though. Well, no, but they're a reflection of the formal definitions. So this is all that... I am going to check. I bet you that the formal definitions, which are not trailing this, are just as bad. Exactly yeah, same. yeah. So let's yeah. let's let's go to the very top. So the very top of this fire turtle business is element. Now, the the this is the definition of element is something like base definition for all elements in a resource. Now that's circular, but it's also confusing the definition of something with the definition of the definition of something. Now, this is called the use mention confusion. It's like saying that swimming is healthy and has eight letters. So we're told that an element is a base definition for all elements in a resource. So every element is a definition, which means that the definition of every element is a definition of a definition which means that 
It's also a definition of a definition of a definition, and so on ad infinitum. So, all right. Then there are backbone elements. Now, in a good ontology, a backbone element would be a type of element. We're not told anything like that. That would be the good practice for writing definitions. You, you define a term by saying what the parent term is and what the differentia is. So a backbone element is an element which forms a backbone, and then you define the differentia. What is the backbone? But here we're told something quite different. A backbone element now is a base for elements defined inside a resource. So that means, I suppose, that there are some elements not defined inside. Are there any elements not defined inside a resource? Help me here. Uh, I don't know. So what? <laughs> OK. Element definition base component. So there's a lot of chatter here, but the beginning is information about the base definition of an element. So now we have an element is a kind of definition, and an element definition base component is a kind of information about that definition, I guess. And so an element definition base component is both part of an element definition and information about the same element definition. Now that, if you can make that work, you are a very clever person. It's not a good starting point for a coherent anything. So it's just twisted. No one is thinking here. So, 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 something went wrong, and I believe it's bad parentage. All right, so then we have element definition base component path, which is defined again. The path, we don't know what a path is that identifies the base element which matches the element definition path. Now, I believe another, part, another problem here is redundancy. So we have element definition base component paths, and we have element definition paths. These two should be defined in such a way that one is a special case of the other. But there's no attempt to do anything like that. Instead, we have matching, which sounds like redundancy. Why do we have both? And then we have, now this is really nice. I, don't, I have no idea what it means. Element definition slicing component discriminator. I think this might be what I was referring to earlier as the differentia. So you have a definition, and A is a B which sees. B is the parent term, C is the differentia. So maybe element definition slicing component discriminator means that C term in a definition, in a good definition. So. I have no idea. Nowhere are we told what slicing is. No one are we, nowhere are we defined child elements. Now, maybe these are secret things that fire people know about. I don't think even HL7 people know about slicing. Um, and so on. The value of the child elements in the instance data shall completely distinguish which slice the element in the resource matches. <sighs> And then we have extension. Now, remember the title of this whole document is Fire Definitions. The nearest we come to element extension in the way of definitions is may be used to represent informa additional information that is not part of the basic definition of the element. Now, that doesn't tell us anything about what it is. It tells us about what it may be used to do. But I may be used to Say something nice about HL7. That doesn't tell anything, tell you anything about me. So this is just chatter. It's bits of text. And then code. This is another example of a necessary condition. Every code is this, but it doesn't tell us what a code is. It tells us what a string is of a certain kind. A code has to be somehow generated by a coding system. It doesn't say that. And similarly, an ID is any combination of letters, numerals, and so on with a length of such and such. That's not a definition of ID. That's, that just tells us that there are strings of certain sorts. In another, this is another kind of issue. So an instant is defined as an instant in time. Well, thank you very much. But then it goes on to say known at least to the second, which means that all instants are known. There are no unknown instants. Now, this is confusing knowledge with the 
entities which you're having knowledge about. All right, a bit more. Extension, we've seen that. So we have optional extensions element found in all resources. Now, that sounds to me like it's not optional. Um, backbone element modifier extension, well, so not a single definition in the entire document. Uh, okay, then. There are one or two signs which, from my point of view, are quite interesting. So here it says, birthplace is a kind of fire extension definition. And then it says, type of variation expressed using sequence ontology or LOINC answer list 48006-1. So there is a reference here to one of the Oberfoundry ontologies, namely the sequence ontology, I think. Maybe they, they have their own sequence ontology, but still. And then we have another one of those. X birthplace is a kind of fire extension. And the, this X birthplace occurs quite a lot. Now, I think this is just a speculation because I don't understand a word of this document. But I think this birthplace here is a, a find and replace error. It appears seemingly at random uh, and means nothing. It's never defined. Now, I have n noticed over the years that there are some very strange phenomena in HL7 texts which are results of find and replace. So you can track spelling mistakes, for instance. And you, you, if you track back, you see that they, those spelling mistakes were created by find and replace operations across large documents. And they stick because no one ever reads those documents, except me. <laughs> so, I, just as a, a friendly gesture, I would check the use of the word birthplace. I think it's, a, 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 it's just not, it doesn't make any sense where it occurs. So a birthplace is not something which is documented by a, a sequence ontology term. Maybe the birth genetics might be, but not the birthplace. All right, so the second rule of ontology building is read. The first rule is think. Um, this is another birthplace. It's, it seems random. I have no idea what it means, but it seems to be in the wrong. It's not a, anyway. So how would any of this yield interoperability? You have all of these clever people coding all of these coding systems and, and creating mappings to fire. How will this help? Fire is not stable. That, that's reasonable. It's new. But it doesn't seem to be on a, 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 a evolutionary path to stability because it's, it's full of non-modular complexity. Um, and, and we have all of the, the idea of behind fire is that we have many, many different people coding using different coding systems. They're all going to create maps to fire and thereby create interoperability. Now, who will guarantee that they, they create the maps consistently? Because no one, well, there are going to be very few people in the world who understand fire. And they're going to be busy doing other, other things. All right, so. So Tom Beale, who has been watching all of this, and he is one of the few people who sent, he sent me information for HL7 Watch uh, who was willing to have his name revealed. Um, he says that the, the, the open air people should embrace the, the best practices which have been developed in the Oboe Foundry community. So use BFO, use the information artifact ontology, and so on. Now I think, uh, and, and then the idea is that you don't create fire, which is something which is reasonable to want, uh, uh, interoperability, Benchmark for coding systems. You don't create fire in the same way that HL7 works by having a voting system and lots of lots of contributions for, from ev everybody. Rather, you have a small team of real experts who build a, co a computationally coherent coding system target for interoperability. And they do this in such a way that it works well with the working ontology contributions which we already have. And that... that I think, and Tom Beale thinks, means the Oboe Foundry. Um, and the sequence ontology is down there. So there would be one link between fire and uh, the Oboe Foundry. Basic formal ontology is at the top. Information artifacts are down the right. We have things like an environment ontology. 
we have the ontology for general medical science, which is the demonstration of how you do this kind of work in a modular fashion, which allows consistent extensions along a very simple, uh, following a very simple recipe, which is exactly the same recipe we use for formulating definitions. And we also have the ontology for biomedical investigations. And we can think of the IAO and OB as being where the data go, which are about the biological processes and the diseases and so forth. So we have the ingredients here for creating the ontological basis for a decent interoperability platform for medical data. Now, this Obo Foundry approach is, is being adopted more and more outside the healthcare world. So we now have the Common Reference Ontologies for Plants, which is a, a big uh, operation funded by the NSF and, and the European Union, to do for agriculture what the Obo Foundry is doing for biomedicine. And we also, and this is the uh, plant crop uh, ontology module um, diagram. And we have the United Nations ontology framework. We have the CIA. We have the United States Geological Survey. We have various Army and Navy and Air Force and Highway Administration initiatives in ontology, all of whom are using BFO. So healthcare is the next. Um, well, no, the, I'm going to end with this. So I am going to reboot the HL7 watch. I haven't decided on a, whether I'm going to rename it, but I'm thinking along these sorts of lines. And that's the end. So I think that, that is more of a question for David. So I, this is my view of the Yosemite, Yosemite uh, and FIRE movements, which they're, they're not the whole of FIRE, but they're the, the part of FIRE which are interesting from our point of view, and not only because David is in the room. So I, as I explained, he and I already engaged on this topic, and there was much more agreement in that engagement and I, he hasn't said much yet, but then, then I might be here. But basically, I agree that we have an opportunity with this, the talent in the world of the semantic web and with the open standards and so forth. We have an opportunity to do right what HL7 tried to do, but in my view, with V3 anyway, failed. And I think that I agree with the principles. What I don't agree with is much of the content. And not because it's wrong, but because it's incoherently clunged together. So there's no step-by-step, -step, starting with the, the simplest terms, like object and processes, and then going down to living subject or organism, animal, person. So that there's no systematic way of doing that, because everything is clunged together. And there's the, the rule should be that you, shouldn't, you can't use a more complex term to define a less complex term. So one typical failure, and I'm making this up now, it's not a real one, but I can find lots of real ones. You define a, um, uh, the, the, an act of giving a medication to a patient as act recorded in the medical administration subject drug delivery record system, something like that then that's very typical of HL7. You define simple things in terms of long round trips. And that's, I see a lot of that also in the fire turtle. Now, what we would need to do is to find the relevant starting point. I think the relevant starting point may be OGMS and IAO. Because there we follow exactly that rule. We define very simple things. And then gradually we allow other people to define more complex things, like the things that fire needs 
in terms of that simple starting point. That was actually the, 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 the idea behind this session. Uh, but they took away three quarters. We were going to have three hours for this, um, which was plenty of time. Uh, but anyway, Ed. So, um, you should introduce yourself since you're kind of an honorary participant. Honorary? Well, honorable. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the former president of HL7, and, and, and many ones. other things. I'm, well, but, you know, I, I, and, and, and but he's a nice man. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem, of course, is, is that if, if, if you have the single person who makes all the rules, then it's tough to get everybody in the world to use them. So there, there are lots of other factors that you didn't discuss. Um, but, but the, one of the questions that, that I have for you, a serious one, is SIMI, which is a clinical information modeling. Yep. Is that coming into HL7? Is that going to make this worse or better? And it's moving into fire. I mean, some fire resources may be based on SIMI models. So my problem is that I now have the same knowledge of SIMI that I had of fire before I started looking under the, under the stones. So you've got great faith that HL7 can manage to screw up. Well. <laughs> so one of the, the conversations I had with Graham Greve when he decided to have FHIR be part of HL7 was that, oh, then FHIR is doomed because the HL7 people will, will breathe their <laughs> stuff into it and it, will so, just be, it won't be simple anymore. The yeah. HL7 is not the land of simplicity. I mean, and he wanted it to be simple. You're correct. In a lot of your statements, I mean, and it turns out to be individual strong personalities, uh, and certainly V3 and Woody B, yeah. uh, that uh, you're, if you change some of those characteristics, you're, you're beating on his child kind of thing. And so those are difficult if you involve a larger set of people. It would be nice to be able to do that. The, 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 how, how much more complex is a clinical community? I, I'm really impressed with all the other people that have, that have uh, built ontologies around the model that, that you're talking about. Uh, naively, I would suggest that clinical uh, activities are a lot more complex because they're, they're not as firm a set of rules. Even, even genomics is a, is a firm set of okay, rules. Okay, so I think that this is not something that I have thought through carefully, but I think that the HL7 world developed in a time when it was very important to have um, very, very precise, what we would now call interoperability, across the entire scope of health patient relevant data. So you have a lab in a hospital, you have the hospital who orders a test, and you want the lab to send back the information in such a way that you know everything that you could conceivably want to know. So was it delayed? What was, what, when was the sample taken? Uh, was the sample delivered uh, correctly? And so on. I don't know. A long, long list of things because you were dealing with walkie-talkie kinds of connections. Now, that, I think, is going to be complicated. That kind of safety-assuring exchange of messages. It's going to be complicated for forensic reasons and for healthcare reasons and so on. But we'd have proprietary systems for doing that messaging, which work and which are built and which I don't have any reason to care about. But then FHIR comes along and says, we need interoperability across all medical institutions, all labs, all drug companies, everyone who's using clinical data should use FHIR so that they're all interoperable. Now, for that kind of goal, I don't think that precise forensic safety kinds of um, detail is necessary. So what we should do is we should work out precisely where we need interoperability in order to have the clinical data that FHIR wants to deal with be usefully interoperable across many, many different customers and, and researchers and so forth. So we, minim we, we reduce the goal. We don't want interoperability at the granularity of HL7 rim, 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 where you have no M's each time, um, we have interoperability across six use cases initially. And then once we've got those working in a really simple way, we look at one or two more. 
I, I agree with that. And I think we're, we're taping this. So interoperability is not global, it's, it's really level. So, yeah. yeah, you should not aim for interoperability and uh, forensically absolutely super safe precision um, because you'll, you, then you're completely lost. Sivaram? So I just download, I used, yeah. I used the text file. I, I yeah, and David said that they came directly from Fire, the uh, automatic version. Yeah. Right, yeah. Now looking at the definition. Except for birthplace. Somebody did a find and replace with birthplace. Looking at the definition. Or maybe birthplace is in the original. So in 2012, Graham Greve gave a talk in Vancouver, and he says, oh, he tells us how it's pronounced. He says, it's essentially HL7 version 4, but it won't be marketed that way. And then at the bottom, it says, still built on RIM, but more hidden. Now, I, I, I'll send him the slides. If the audio works, I'll send him the video. Hmm? Well, they should have worked harder to hide it in a. Yeah. yeah. Why should we take fire seriously? So I, my, I have a really selfish reason. I just wanted to stop doing the HL7 Watch blog. So I was hoping fire would give me the excuse. Fire is a wonderful thing. I don't need the blog anymore. It would be. It would be. But, but that's not a very good reason. Why should we take fire seriously? Why should we take fire seriously? I think the simple answer is that it seems to have a lot of momentum behind it. Mm. It looks like it's going to have a lot of adoption, as far as I can tell, anyway. So, so, so. The, real, the real part of that really is it's almost like that much of, of what people are doing with fire is really not based on the rim. You do what you want to do, you do what you want to do, and then you map backwards if you want to do that. And not a lot of that's happening. Much of this is really, really, really quick. So, you know, I have a, we're total agreement with version, version three messaging, particularly. Yep. It's not been used, and, and, and it, it is it's a model that was created by computer labs and mathematicians, not by clinicians, for one thing. But hopefully, Fire gets a little bit more of that flavor. And I think what you're talking about is, is uh, very true. Interoperability doesn't have to be a global concept. Everything and anything. It, it really, it, we need to focus on particular use cases. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely. If we can get that happening in fire, then it will have value. And the core of fire because it's a patient resource and it's still, it's still computer science. Yeah. That's the good thing about Ogums. The, the Ogums was built by people who are clinicians. Yeah. So I, but I think that fire in to a large extent, is trying to, to limit the use cases. I mean, th this 80-20 rule is pervasive in the, the FIRE uh, way of thinking about things and evaluating what to include and what not to include. They are just trying to include the 80% most commonly used cases. But even the 80-20% is open to interpretation. Oh, I, absolutely. Half of it is yes. interpreted yes. the wrong way. Yep. Right. yep. Um, <coughs> Yep. Because what you just brought described as walkie talkies, which is how HL7 was designed, and it does, it sends it from point A to point B. And it's not needed at point A anymore. When people talk about interoperability, they have not defined this at all. I have not seen a single definition of interoperability that is practical. And the failure of all these different standards is because people seem to think that if we just had the right ontology, people would be interoperable without defining interoperable. So I can give you my definition. Do not know what interoperability means. So 
So why don't you give us your definition, and then I'll give you mine. I'll give you the definition that the common man in the, or woman in the U.S. thinks, which is I go from hospital A where I normally get my care, and I go to hospital B, and they have the same information, and that information is up to date and accurate. And if hospital B gets information, think about this, and the patient says, that information is wrong, and hospital B deletes the information from the record in hospital B, does hospital A get that deletion? Because I can tell you, the patient thinks they're going to get it, but they're not. Good. Try to do deletion interoperably. Okay. I have done it, so I know how hard it is. Okay, so I think what you just defined is hospital interoperation, which is to be defined in terms of a more general interoperability yeah, definition. Yeah, it's, it's, no, yeah. okay, so let me give you my definition of interoperability. Two systems are interoperable. It's two systems A and B are interoperable. If system B can use the data from system A and understand it with the same degree of precision as its own data, and vice versa. So we, if we have interoperability if systems can understand each other's data with the same degree of precision and reliability as, as they can understand their own data. It, to have interoperation, however, you need more. They need to be, have, have a legal right to see the other data. And then there needs to be some kind of handshake so that if they make changes, the relevant changes are sent back as requests to the original system. And that's more complicated. But interoperability, I think, is what we're aiming for, but what FIRE is aiming yeah, for. And, and I think in that case, you would have to define what you mean by understand. I mean, it could be just. I, that's what I'm <laughs> yeah, here yeah, for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. No, we're in agreement. So the gentleman at the back. simple definition from actually from Wikipedia for semantic interoperability and it is the ability of computer systems to exchange data with unambiguous shared meaning. Of course you might ask what the meaning means, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. So I want to add one more one more thing too because because I want what I want when I want it. And so part of what interoperability has to do is to give me the data that I that I want from the set that you've got. So it's more than being able to Give me the right data and exactly that. Nothing more, nothing less. And that's tough. But if you got that data, could you use it as effectively as the first two systems? I think the answer to that is, is yes. Not yet, though. You can get into your EHR without entering it manually. Yeah. Okay, I agree. Receive RAM? Yes. With why, why is that important? Is it because you want the <coughs> primary persistence format? Uh, why is it important? Uh, it's important to be considered a full-fledged uh, fire serialization on par with the XML and the JSON. Right? The XML and the JSON uh, representation carry the same information. Right? And we want the RDF representation to have the same status as an official RDF, uh, excuse me, as a, an official fire representation. So that's going to take a lot of overhead to, to do, to think to do. I think uh, in what we did with the Magic DB project at the Jim and Senate was keep the XML as a primary persistent format. Yeah, and, and the RDF is secondary. RDF yeah, derivative format. As many times as you want. 
And there was a good reason for that, which is all the, some of the things that you brought up about order and sequencing and all that stuff. Yep. If, if you don't want, if you don't need RDF as a primary consistent format for applications where you're recording data and storing it in that way, then it's a lot of work to just yeah. for that single thing. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so I'll tell you there's a, there's a second, uh, there's another hidden reason, okay? Um, and that is, in the overall Yosemite project um, vision, ultimately, the goal is to make RDF be used as a universal healthcare exchange language, okay? So if RDF becomes a full-fledged fire serialization, that is a foot in the door, in a sense, toward that goal. So you're right that it does create uh, additional work that we have to do to make it round trippable, but it's part of the overall uh, goal of uh, exposing, in, of making a step toward exposing the world more to RDF. So I, I would like to ask a question for you yep. also. Uh, first of all, the, the, the a fire looks very old-fashioned with the dot notation and these really long camel case clunky expressions which are not modularized so that you could see the definitions of each. There are lots of problems with those non-definitions. Um, but this doesn't look like the flavor of good RDF. So the people who are doing good work in RDF or in our whole don't work like that because it's, it, that's the old-fashioned way. So you, you, that, that's the first problem. You end up with a really old-fashioned clunky kludge descended from former millennia, uh, which you are now trying to rdf -ize in order to est help establish RDF as the language for healthcare uh, information. But you're, you're going actually to make RDF look bad. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, um, the RDF itself doesn't allow reasoning. You need OWL to do reasoning. And OWL isn't going to be able to cope with this kind of uh, complexity of expression. So you're not going to have the real benefits which you could have by moving into the semantic web. You're going to have the worst of the old world and none of the benefits of the new world. Yeah, I mean, I think those are fair criticisms. <laughs> I mean, just, then, yeah. and then there's the third one, which is, so, and this, is, this upsets me about Graham Greve also. So he just released version two or something of Fire, still a drug. And he said, and he said, and I have to thank the, all of these people, and then he gives a list of 26 people, and then there are many more that I have to thank. It's all very clubby. And the more people you have trying to build a complicated thing like this, the worse it's going to become, unless you have very, very nice controls. They don't have any controls, yeah. it, it seems from this. And so they also allow extensions. Now, all of those extensions of fire are going to need to be checked for compatibility. But if extensions are, even if there are certain constraints on extensions, there is no authority which is going to say, no, this extension isn't allowed because we already have a, an extension for dentistry or something. Um, so, and I think this is just a recipe for... I want to make a comment, <coughs> because David comes to HR7 meetings. What I, really I would like to come, but they keep disinviting me. <laughs> that's not true. You it is true. I, yes. I was invited, but then the, the invitation was, the, the, was withdrawn. To me, you know, all of the, everybody has a bias. You aren't worth anything if you don't have a bias. So, but, but I can't understand why we can't go fight this out. Uh, and it really would be a pretty intense meeting to get all of it. And, 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 you know, if Al is a better, a better way of moving this, and then we... This ought to be what we're trying to do to solve a problem. I mean, we've been trying to solve a problem for, for too many years, and we're now coming up on 27 years for the existence of HR. 27 years. Yeah, and uh, I was young then. And uh, what we need to do is, to, is now's an opportunity because change is underway with fire. Uh, it is still a draft standard, and it's an opportunity of really going back and make the case of why you want things done this way versus, yep. versus this way. Because most people are doing what they believe in, and, and, and we need to help mold some of that. So, yep. I, think so I think that, that David is right to do the RDF first. Yes. But you should do the RDF properly so that you make the use of OWL 
selectively yep. possible because you won't be able to use owl for everything. And Sivaram is right that um, um, in order to enable this kind of uh, uh, more, more sophisticated, more powerful reasoning, you need to give up the idea that you will have a round trip of possibility. You're going to need to have certain selected areas be uh, uh, formulated in OWL. That will generate more content, which you won't be able to feed back. But if back. OWL is a solution, why have the others? I mean, go oh, it's because the OWL is only... A, a solution for those things which you can express using OWL, and OWL's expressivity is rather weak. But you can grow it. You can't grow it beyond these limits. Okay. So you can grow it in, by adding more content, but you can't grow it by adding content of a certain sort. Okay. So there, the OWL is, is harder to do, it takes more work, so you shouldn't try and do it for everything because you'll fail. Okay.